Hi, folks. It's Larry Miller, and I want to let you know I'm not on the mainland at home, and I'm not on Milleronia. I'm uh, making a movie in western Massachusetts, and I told you a tiny bit about it last week, but boy, oh boy, as long as I'm here, and it won't be long, we'll be back in town making another show next week. But here's a classic Larry episode. And don't worry, if there's one thing I won't do again, it's yell at any state troopers here. Can you imagine that? You can't imagine that. Because if I did, I know I'd meet some of the same guys I did back in school days. And there I'd be back in the locker room again. Folks, be well. Enjoy this show, and I'll see you next time. And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who loves stuffed toys. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And you know something? It is a gorgeous day here on Milleronia. True, I control the weather, and it's always a gorgeous day, but it doesn't stop me from loving it. And Colonel Jeff feels the same way because he's, he's honest that way. Not because he's afraid I'm going to toss him in a volcano. Well, you're a little afraid, right? Yeah, a little afraid, but not too afraid. But it's gorgeous here today, folks. And, oh, boy, and that music. When it's a gorgeous day on Milleronia, the music makes me feel even better. Of course, that's the Edward Starkman Orchestra and the Tina Adonio Dancers featuring boy tenor Mike Lucking asking the musical question, Is there any bigger buzzkill than the back-to-school ads in July? No, Mike, there isn't. There just isn't. It, it, boy, that is a bullseye. There is nothing worse than back to school ads. You you don't want to see the ads anyway when you're you know watching one of the James Bond movie spectaculars. But you know the the truth is, Colonel Jeff and I read this from Mike, and we were just saying we kind of like supply ads for school, paint and shoes and. Uh, well, pants and notebooks and pencils, and but not before September. Never before September. Plus, those are ads, really, for the parents. Those are ads so that mom and dad can say, sure, let's get them some of those khakis or something like that. They're not saying, boy, how wonderful school is. In fact, Colonel Jeff was just mentioning he used to know a fellow when he was a kid who loved back-to-school ads and really looked forward to the start of school. And Colonel Jeff looked at me and said, I always thought he was crazy. I still think he's crazy. People like that run for Congress. And you know what? That's actually the truth. They run for, even if not something as high as Congress, they, they want, they'll run for mayor of their towns or supervisor for water or something or other than that. But you know what? No. I don't want to see back to school ads when I'm trying to watch Sean Connery and Ursula Andress dance with each other. And you know what? That is that. So, uh, so good work. I don't even know if there was something when I was a kid. Did I want to see back to school ads? No, I don't think, no. Did you? No. I mean, we know we're going back to school, but it's still summer. It's July or before that, it's June for crying out loud. No back to school ads. Hey, looking forward to September. No, I'm not. So you know what? Good work again, Mike. And by Amazon and PayPal and my book. That's right. We love our sponsors. You know what? Amazon is such a great company. They're still the only company in the world that does three things no other company can do. One, order whatever you want. You'll get it. Two, they already have it. 
You don't have any delay. There's no, they don't have to call for it. They don't have to order it themselves. They don't have to make it or try to look for it. It's right there in the, in their giant warehouse, their Indiana Jones warehouse that's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile deep and a heck a mile high. And, uh, that's not just on party days, but you know what? Amazon is, does a great job on that. And uh, they they have it all ready. And the third thing that no one else does that's really the most important, they send us a percentage of whatever it is you order. Now, that may not sound like much to you, but it is to us. And it's, oh, it's very meaningful. In fact, we get all the money we get from Amazon, we put right into the fund for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner and two drinks beforehand in a different place. And so, you know what? You should, if you want to be part of Amazon, and you should, but you can go there, of course, you can get there on the, uh, well, the iPhone, your, your laptop, whatever you want to do, but don't do that. What you do is go to our website, go to LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> Whew. Boy, I'm sorry, it must have been the locks. <laughs> at any rate go to our website we have a banner that says amazon click our banner and we'll get you there click our banner and go go take a nap go lie down in your big lazy boy chair and put a magazine over your face and and just get some get some z's and we'll get you there doesn't matter when you want to go Colonel Jeff and I, it could be the middle of the night, it could be on Milleroni or back on the mainland, that uh, we are, the little red light on our phones goes off, and that's usually the one we only use to call the president, but boy, oh boy, we'll get you to Milleronia. We'll get together in, in the closest studio, and we'll get you there. And and so, you know, go go to our website and go to Amazon, and buy PayPal, we have a banner for them, too. Boy, PayPal, you feel like you're saving the world when you work with PayPal. And maybe you are. Who knows? And uh, PayPal is great. If you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send a few bucks here to help out, and why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. That's right. Now, instead of saying donate, I, I don't like, you know, words like that. Donate this or pay what you like or join the Platinum Committee. I always like to say buy us some drinks. That's right. That's a good way to do it. And uh, there are, because there are different levels, there's levels one through five all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> Boy, that fella is at uh, he, that fella is at level five himself, and so you know what? Look for their banner for PayPal on our website too. Remember that's LarryMillerPodcast dot com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> that's a pretty good one. <laughs> The colonel just patted himself on the back there, and he deserves that. But thank you in advance, because everything you send, you remember, uh, every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who's contributed already. It's very meaningful. And thank you in advance to those of you who are going to contribute today or just thinking about it. So thanks, folks. And by me, my book. Signed hardcover copies of my book, Spoiled Rotten America, are now for sale at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. And uh, I think you're going to love my book. It's uh, I had a lot of fun writing it. It's uh, And it's funny. And you know what? It did really well when it was released, and I'm very proud of that. And now, well, you can get it too. Signed hardcover copies. And they're now for sale, Spoiled Rotten America, at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. And that brings us to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. Nothing better than a good joke. And I uh, I really believe that. Something that you can pass on, by the way. If you like the joke, 
Well, it's uh, it's very important. Nothing like a good laugh on any good day. The beginning of the day or the end of the day, or what the heck, the middle of the day, too. So, you know what, folks? Here's a good one. Both the Colonel and I like this one, and uh, we hope you do, too. Our setting is a beautiful day on a highway out in the middle of nowhere, and a lovely blonde is driving a red sports car. And uh, she's uh, zipping down the lane there, no other cars around. And uh, sure enough, after a few minutes, she's uh, pulled over a police car, turns on the siren behind her, and pulls her over. And the cop gets out of the car, and the cop walks over to her, and the cop is a blonde, too. And the cop says to her, uh, license and registration, please. And, well, like anyone would be, she's a little nervous in the red sports car, but she says, oh, okay, uh, sure, yeah. And uh, she, uh, she's, her hands are shaking a tiny bit, and she opens her purse, and she can't find her license. And she looks through it, and she says, to to the police officer, to the other blonde, I can't, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't find the, 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 the license, and uh, what... What do they look like? And and the cop says, uh, "Well, uh, they're the license. It's a uh, well, it's about it's about the size of a credit card. It's rectangular, and it has you on it. It has your picture on it. And uh, the uh, blonde in the sports car says, "Okay, okay. Oh, and she looks through again, and she really looks through, and well, she finds a mirror." which is about that size. And uh, she finds a little mirror about the size of a driver's license and she picks it up and she looks at it and she sees her own face in the mirror and she thinks to herself, well, all right, yeah, maybe, th- maybe this is it. And she hands that to the police officer and uh, the officer looks at it and says, oh, that's all right, you can go on. I didn't realize you were a cop. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? You know, we've talked about this before, and I mean it every time. There are some great structures in joke telling. The classics, of course, are a guy walks into a bar, and, you know, that just sets you up. It sets me up. I like to hear that because I know what I'm doing then. And that's true with, uh, well, just the word blonde somehow means that uh, a blonde driving a sports car and a blonde driving a police car. And I'm already in that joke. So uh, you know what? I hope you like that one. The colonel hopes you like that one. Tell it to your friends and family if you do. And, uh, well, we'll have another one next week. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show, The Poetry Corner. string quartet also always puts me in a good mood and uh this is a good one folks it's a there's a, a a good poem is just like a good joke it's a great addition to life and this one is written by phyllis wheatley and i've read from her before she was uh, born in gambia and was uh, brought to america she came to america it's funny they used the word brought. She was she came to America. Wow, so she just decided to come to America. Well, she was brought here as a slave. And the family she was sold to taught her to read and write and encouraged her poetry. She had good poetic success, too. And then the family emancipated her. They, uh, they uh, set her free and bought two more. No, no, they didn't do that, but they, they they could have, I guess. It's in any case, Phyllis Wheatley was very talented and a good soul, and uh she wrote this one called A Hymn to the Morning. And here it is. Attend my lays, ye ever honored nine, assist my labors and my strains refine. 
in smoothest numbers pour the notes along, for bright Aurora now demands my song. Aurora, hail, and all the thousand dies, which deck thy progress through the vaulted skies. The morn awakes, and wide extends her rays. On every leaf the gentle zephyr plays. Harmonious lays the feathered race resume, dart the bright eye, and shake the painted plume. Ye shady groves, your verdant gloom display to shield your poet from the burning day. Calliope awake the sacred lyre, while thy fair sisters fan the pleasing fire. The bowers, the gales, the variegated skies, in all their pleasures in my bosom rise. See in the east the illustrious king of day. His rising radiance drives the shades away. But, oh, I feel his fervid beams too strong, and scarce begun concludes the abortive song. Well, isn't that lovely? That's an interesting way to look at the, well, the sunrise. And uh, she says earlier in that, the, uh, whew, boy, the honored nine. And those are the planets, the nine planets. And, uh, boy, oh, boy, folks, a good poem by a good poet. Well, it's a good thing for us, too, and I hope you like that one. And that brings me now to my third favorite part of the show. M, 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 Triple M, the magic movie moment. There's still nothing also like a great poem and a, and a great joke, a great movie. And I know you like those and I do too. And uh, it's a good way to talk about them. That every great movie that you love that maybe you've seen 30 times still has a magic movie moment in it. It could be one line, it could be a scene, it could be a whole character, it could be a whole part of the story. But this one has a great story. It's from 1962, The Road to Hong Kong. And yes, that's, first of all, it's one of the Bob Hope, Bing Crosby road movies. And those are so good. And this is the last road movie, by the way, that was made. And The Road to Hong Kong, directed by Norman Panama. Star starring, well, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, Joan Collins, Dorothy L'Amour, Robert Morley, and oh, a much larger cast of really funny folks. And you know what? This takes place, well, it's in Hong Kong, and uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby are, well, playing sort of good con men. They have a show they do also, but they're, they're just traveling the world looking to make a couple of bucks, and sometimes it's a little shady, but they're good guys, and well, and it, like every movie of theirs, we just like them. And you know what? They're mistaken for other guys who are part of a bad group. And this is the group called the Third Echelon. And uh, that's a group that wants to take over the universe. It's made up mostly of mad scientists. And uh, why wouldn't it be? There are plenty of those. And Robert Morley is the head of it. He's the head of the whole group. You've seen Robert Morley a thousand times, by the way. If you don't, uh, if you can't put a face to the name, he's a great actor. He's a British actor, and uh, he's <laughs> he was good in everything he did. And in this, he plays well the Chinese head of the third echelon, and he's got uh, robes on, and uh, plus he's got uh, then. Uh, makeup on, and he's uh, got, oh, got the long fingernails. He's the head of the whole thing. And at one point, he has uh, captured Bob and Bing. And uh, this is after they meet their old friend, Dorothy L'Amour, who's performing at a club. The reason I'm laughing to that is it's terrific. It's a very good road picture. But they made a bunch of them with Dorothy L'Amour. And she's not in this one, so you could just see... Well, the movie being written and someone in the studio saying, or Bing saying to Bob, you know, why don't we just call Dottie up and bring her back in this? We always have a good time. 
And uh, who would who would say no to that? So that's funny. Their friend, who's singing in town in Hong Kong, comes by to help them. <laughs> I just love things like that. And uh, and at one point they they're on another planet. The third echelon decides to send them to the moon, but it's it's actually another planet named Plutonium. And they go there with Joan Collins, and it's uh, and they they bump into, of course. Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, who have gotten there on a different spacecraft. But I think I remember Bing Crosby saying something. They see them, and they're, well, look, they're on plutonium, and Bing Crosby looks at them and says, oh, looks like the Italians beat us here. At any rate, it's a good movie. It's very funny and lots of fun. And at one point, Robert Morley, as I said, has captured Bob and Bing and tied them to two chairs in his office. And he's describing to them how horrible everything's going to be. Because in his office, by the way, there's huge windows, but they're under the sea. And there are sharks swimming behind the windows there. And <laughs> and uh, Morley holds his hand out with the long fingernails, and he points to the sharks and says, Man-eating sharks. And... <laughs> Bob Hope turns to Bing and says, what about actors? And Crosby turns to him and says, we're safe. <laughs> and it's just, well, that was so great anyway. There's so, you know, Bing won an Academy Award, but you can't love actors and in a buddy picture and a structure like The Road to. There was so many great road movies, The Road to Shanghai, The Road to Morocco, The Road to Everywhere. And uh, they were all terrific. But that but that scene and the way they deal with it really epitomized those movies to me. And I just, just love it. It pops you out for a second, but it's a good second. It's a happy second. <laughs> Man-eating sharks. What about actors? We're safe. <laughs> it's just good stuff. So see that sometime. You know what? Do see that. It's it's a great... Any of the road pictures are just... Oh, they're worth the time and the energy. It just makes you laugh and smile. And then just love... Well, their friend Dorothy L'Amour, too. And she's wonderful. She's great in all these. Joan Collins was great in this one. But you can't beat Robert Morley in the big robes with the long fingernails saying, Man eating shocks. And uh, you know what? It makes me happy, too, because I wanted to tell you, this is a special day here on Milleronia. Every day, in a way, is special here on Milleronia. I love it very much. But today, our head guide at the volcanoes is retiring. That's right. Ali Dungmeister, been with the, uh, been with us 50 years, and he retires today. That's not an easy job, by the way. 50 years walking people from their cells up there to the volcanoes and tossing them in. But there's more to it than that. He talks to them, too. That may not sound like much, but as you can imagine, you know, these folks get a little nervous, especially at the end there, and Ali is good company. So he talks to them. Mostly it's jokes. He tells them jokes. And they laugh more than you'd think, you know. They cry, too, of course, a lot of crying. And uh, they beg and plead and sometimes they try to fight back, but, you know, Ollie you know, is, a, is a big fella boy and tough as nails, and over the years, he's broken a few of them in half, and then he tosses those pieces in into the volcano, and, well, word gets around, as you can imagine it would, and people learn there's no way out. So they might as well just laugh at Ollie's jokes and, well, do what's do what's listed for them, do what's written. Good old Ollie, though. He's married, and he and Magda have four kids, nice family. In fact, he met his wife at Volcano Number 2. And that doesn't happen all the time, because you, well, you may have wondered. Volcano 1, of course, is just a, well, that's a strict, straight volcano. You just get tossed in there, and you go right in and right down. And that is it. You are gone. That burns the life out of you in well, a tenth of a second, maybe less. Maybe a hundredth of a second. 
And that's pretty hot in there. But uh, Volcano 2 is worse. It's uh, much worse, in fact. And you may be wondering, you know, how, how is it worse than one? Well, it is because they don't toss you right in. They, you get tossed, but there are places to stand. There are little outcroppings you can land on. There aren't in Volcano Number 1. But in Volcano 2, well, well if, you, if you hit one of those ledges there and, and you're on it, well, it's, it's pretty hot down there, but you're not in the lava yet. And a number of folks have uh, climbed out, started to climb out. They're on a ledge and they, you know, put one foot up and they, and they, well, they get themselves up there. Obviously, the guards don't let them. That's part of what being a god is. They, they have pea shooters and they can, well, just pop a pea right in someone's forehead there and it just, you know, that'll, that'll distract you. It, it really cuts your attention away and you get a lot of, whoa, 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 whoa. And they, just go backwards there. Well, and then they go, of course, into the flame and explode. But a lot of times there's, uh, there have been, in fact, seven or eight prisoners who have gotten out. They've been on that ledge and they start to climb and they get out. True, all of them are young and pretty women. But after all, for crying out loud, folks, the guards are lonely up there. And love is love, isn't it? And even in a volcano, that's my feeling. Love is love. In fact, they used that as a motto on a lot of their denim jackets for their yearly festivals. Love is love. But uh, that's how Ali met Magda. She, uh, he, you know what? She was on that ledge and started to climb out. And he leaned in with his pea shooter. But folks... He looked at her, and she looked at him, and it was love at first sight. Well, it was for him. It was, uh, for her, it was just, that was a look of, can you please help me get out of here now? And he did. He lowered a rope, and he, he showed her just visually how to wrap it around herself, and he pulled her up, and he pulled her out, and she was, well, she was shaking. She got out of that volcano. And and again, now they looked at each other. They're right there. And her legs were shaking and her arms were shaking. And uh, again, love at first sight. They, they just, they had their first kiss right there. Well, he did. Anyway, uh, for her, it was more of just, you know, she was just glad to not be in there. And he gave her a cup of water. And she was very grateful, and then he kissed her, and uh, she kissed him, or just let him. And, well, they've had phew, a great life. Let's see, there's, he's been 50 years, he's been working for us up there on the volcanoes, and they've been married 37 years now, four kids, as I mentioned, and boy, and they've never had a fight. Isn't that something? Isn't that nice to know? Never one fight. Well, it's a, it's, it's a unique situation. I mean, sometimes she gets mad at him. He's reading the paper at night after work and he's got the sports section open and then she just gets mad and starts saying, Hey, we never go out. You never take me out. And why don't you take me out? Let's go out. And, uh, well, you know, he lets that go on for, uh, you know, a good, what a good husband does 30 seconds or a minute. And then he lowers the paper and just stares at her for a second and, and that ends the fight right there, you know, because she knows, first of all, he'll take her out and she can take him out. And uh, But arguing with him past a certain point is probably not a good idea because he could right then just take her back to number two. Even number one would be awful, but, you know, he'd, he'd toss her back in number two. And in any case, though, good old Ollie and good old Magda, uh, married 37 years now, and Ollie retires today after 50 years walking people and tossing people into the volcanoes. And, and by the way, that's, you know, you know, our volcanoes are, have more there than, than you might think. We have a gift shop, a terrific gift shop, by the way. And, uh, and that's a nice place to be so that when people come to take a little look, you can take your family up there and warn them. 
and you can watch a couple of people get tossed in screaming, and that's what they do. You know, I don't fault them for that. Hey, you might scream. I might scream too. And uh, in any case, boy, those gift shops, boy, they have, uh, well, they have so much. They have a lot of good coffee table books with photos and uh, of before and after, let us say. And uh, boy, and they have then they have the uniforms of the guards you can get. And uh, those are nice, too. I like them very much. They've given me one, well, every time they change, every year. And that's awfully nice. And they have, uh, well, let's see, they have a gift shop. They do have a restaurant. It's a, it's a coffee shop type of affair that's attached and associated with the gift shop. And, well, look at the fam- boy, the families just love it. So, uh it, it, does it get hot there? Yes, it does. But uh, you know what, folks? It's also hot in the Middle East. And I'm saying that because uh, our older boy, the Marine, is in the Middle East now. He is deployed there. And uh, I'm going to speak to him later, but he, he sent, a, uh, sent us a text already. He's been there about a week. And... Uh, he said it's unbelievably hot. I guess that's no surprise, but boy, first-hand evidence of that. He says it's so hot, he says breathing there is like putting a hair dryer in your mouth. And boy, I bet it is. Can you imagine that? I've never had a hair dryer in my mouth, but I've never wanted to. Bet you haven't either. And... uh I'll speak to him later and find out what's what, and I'll let you know next week. Uh, Arnaldo called, Uncle Arnie called from Brooklyn, and he says, yes, you know what, by the way, that uh, it's very hot there too. And uh, But Colonel Jeff and I and the dogs are here on Milleronia, and it's delightful. A little warm, but just a little, and that's the way I like it. Then that's, yes, again, I know. I'm responsible for the weather. I make the weather and I change the weather. But boy, oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know what I've always wondered, by the way, why can't dog toys be made stronger? I mean, our dogs, well, I love one of them so much. And the other one, well, I allow to live, but which is kind of affectionate. (laughs) But you know what? Those toys, those stuffed toys, they get. My wife gets them, and oh, they they love them. But they're stuffed. They have the white stuffing in them, that fluffy white stuffed thing, and they have a couple of things that make squeak sounds. They have little plastic squeaky sound makers. And well, I, you know what? You give them one of those, and oh, they're happy. Look at that! Oh boy, look at that! Then you turn for just two minutes or so to fill the dishwasher or something, you look back, and now the whole carpeting is covered with white gunk and white stuffy stuff and and the plastic toys. And they're squeaking those things. So, of course, as Colonel Jeff knows, here in the studio, anywhere else in the house, that, well, they you got to get, if you see the dog has one of those squeaky things in in his mouth or her mouth, you got to get it away. You got to get up and go, hey, come here, come here, come here, give me that. Because I I think it'll kill them. You know, we both think, shouldn't we get that away from the dogs? And the answer is, yeah, you should. It's just a little little plastic thing. And So why can't they be made stronger? I've never been the one to say, I'd ever, ever, ever say, well, we can land on, on the moon. We can get a guy up there on the moon. Why can't we make better dog toys? But I'm saying that now. And uh, Colonel Jeff remembered, he said that uh, when he was a boy back in farm country, that they uh, they had a bunch of dogs and just gave them things that were impossible to destroy as their toys, like a uh, cow leg bone, uh, which they love, or tennis balls they always like too, but I mean, the thing is that the dogs never got bored with them. They loved them every day, forever. And you can't destroy a cow leg bone. I mean, it's too late to ask the cow why not, but you can't. 
and they love them. So why can't we make things like that? Or just sell cow leg bones. And uh, plus he said, by the way, their favorite toy, and this never changed, uh, he said uh, was a sock that you tie two knots in. One here, one there, just two knots. That's it. That's the toy. And uh, they can play alone. They can whip that around. and, and uh, 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 They can fight together with it. And one gets one knot in the mouth and one of the other gets another knot in the mouth. And they pull at each other. Those lasted for decades. And you know what? We forget sometimes that dogs don't need stuffed toys that squeak and look like bees and possums. The cuteness is lost on the dogs. I, I really believe that. And it's lost on me, too. I don't think they're so cute. Why is that cute? Why is a green bunny cute? The, the, the cuteness appeals to the owners buying it. Until, of course, the dog eats his head off. Not the owner, the rabbit. I mean, not the... I don't know your dog and I don't know you. But, you know what? How many times have you and I and the colonel... Seen the dog chewing on the squeaky part and taking it away so he doesn't choke on it a lot. That's how often it happens. And I, and I, I know I say that because that's the way it is. And sure, they have things in them that, you know, uh, uh, dogs, God bless them, are just the best when they, they decided somewhere around, what, a million years ago, 100,000 years ago or something ago that they wanted to leave their packs in the wilderness and join ours be with you and me and join our families and and be loved by us and we sure love them and that's that's great i'm glad they made that decision and our our two are right here on the floor in the studio as always and here here's the thing though that uh ozzy my dog the one i i love the one who climbed on my shoulders when i met him at the uh at the doggy place, is the he's the sweetest, calmest, cuddliest family dog in history. I mean, and uh, when the, the second dog, Maggie, rrr, strolls in, though, what they, you know what, they both go back a million years to pack days, and they start growling and biting and swatting and scratching each other to death. And then, or that's some kind of foreplay, because he then always just climbs on her and arches his back. And you don't need to hear any more about that. If you do, I'm sorry, but I think you need to go back a million years. In any case, that... By the way, this this all makes me rethink veterinarians. You know how we th we all think, oh, they're the kindest people in the world. They love all animals. They're not even their animals. And they're so good with them, and they, they're so affectionate... Uh, with them. But, you know, it suddenly it dawned on me that, you know, to spend that much time around killer beasts, they may be crazy. I mean, the, the vets that must get bitten and scratched themselves all the time. But uh, just before we started recording today, I learned another doggy lesson because they, well, they, they went to the bathroom in the house Wink, wink, and, uh, you know, they, uh, but that, that, that happens sometimes. It just, it has to happen. We had, uh, today on Milleronia, my, uh, my uh, wife had a little stomach flu and was uh, still in bed. And, uh, you know, thank goodness, I think she's, she's better now. And, uh, but, so I took the dogs away so that they wouldn't bark when the gardener came. And uh, wake everybody up. So I brought them down here, and I closed the door to the studio, and they were here. And then when Colonel Jeff got here, oh, they love him. That's why I call I call him Uncle Jeff to them. And they uh, and they just oh, they just love him. Ozzy does, and Maggie just well wants to kill him too. But I mean that that's 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 her head. But Ozzy, oh boy, just loves him. And then when I saw I opened the door, I just checked and uh, everyone else was gone around the house. There was no gardener there anymore. So I opened the studio door and uh, they zipped around waist out, you know, ran out. 
And I saw just before we recorded, yes, downstairs here, right next to the studio, they uh, relieved themselves. They did their business, as some people say. And you know what I told the colonel? I said, I've never been... I've never been one to get so mad at things like that anyway. I don't really get mad. I don't know how I can... Well, you know, look at Ozzy. He's just on the floor here in the studio. I love him. And and uh, Maggie's taking a little nap, too. And uh, I just can't, you know, wake them up and say, Look at this. What did you do here? What What is this? Did you do this? And here? And they don't do this. Hey, I, you know what? I... I I can't. I just I just picked it up and in the two places there, and of course flushed it, and then uh, washed my hands, gave him a good silkwood scrub, you know, with the big brush and the anti nuclear stuff. And uh, but I did. I maybe that's the good lesson for us to learn about dogs, anyway. Well, sure, they do this or that. And it uh, brings them back a million years. But I'm glad they still have that in them. And sure, they nip and yip with each other and roll around. And then one of them, <laughs> Ozzy in this case, decides to climb on her back and arches back. But there you are. And if they poop in the house, well, that doesn't bother me so much. And I hope it doesn't bother you so much either. I know it and you know it. But we both... As always, we know the same things, folks. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. So remember, as always... If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to, and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. And that's sure the best truth I know, still is. Be well, and we'll see you here next time.